All right, the title of my sermon this morning is Be a Wise Master Builder. Be a Wise Master Builder. I'm going to come back to 1 Corinthians 3 in a moment. But where I want to start this sermon today, so talking about being a wise master builder, as opposed to what? Being a foolish builder. You know, you probably wouldn't be called a master. I guess you can be a foolish master builder. Um, but be a wise master builder. I'll come back to 1 Corinthians 3. But let's start at 2 Corinthians 4. Look what it says here. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So that's what I want to try and do this morning, talking about being a wise master builder. I want to try and shift your focus this morning from the physical, to the, from the seen to the unseen. This is what 2 Corinthians 4.18 is trying to tell us. Us as spiritual people, as Christians, believers on Jesus Christ, we ought to have our sights not set on the things we can see, but on the things we cannot see. Why does it say that? Because the things which are not, which the things which are seen are temporal. What does that mean? They're temporary. Isn't that a profound thought that everything you can see is not going to last forever? Everything you can see with your eyes. So you think about, you know, even your, your body, right? Your flesh, this is not going to last forever. It's going to be replaced one day for those of us who are saved. But everything that is seen, so you think about the buildings, the houses, the properties, the riches, the cars, the gadgets, the games, the motorcycles, the boats. Everything you can see, one day it's all going to be gone. And that's why that's not where our focus should be. Right? Our focus should not be on the temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, it's important to have an eternal perspective when it comes to living the Christian life. Having an eternal perspective. What do I mean by that? Thinking about the things that don't just happen in this life, but the things that happen in the life hereafter, in, in eternal life. And you know, having an eternal perspective, it can change your perspective on suffering. I mean, this is the very context of 2 Corinthians 4 here. It says, hey, for our light affliction. And if you know about the things that Paul went through, I mean, it was far from light. I mean, you know, beaten, you know, 40 stripes, say one. He was shipwrecked and, you know, didn't have food, didn't always have somewhere to sleep. And yet he says, hey, our light affliction. Why can having an eternal perspective change your perspective on suffering? Because when you think about now, temporary versus eternal, it starts to diminish a bit. If you have the right perspective, diminish your suffering when you put it in the grand perspective of things. Our light of fiction, which is but for a moment. Now, now I understand when you're going through affliction, it doesn't always feel like a moment. That's why it's important to have the right perspective, to realize, yeah, some people may have a lifetime, others may have a disability, but hey, it's still for a moment compared to eternity. Is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are th seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are not which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So changing your perspective and having an eternal perspective can help minimize, you know, help you cope with your own suffering in the world. It also helps people to, you know, sort of think about and minimize the injustice in the world, you know, both by the rich and to the poor. You know, so sometimes you look at the world and you think, hey, you know, these, these rich people, they're getting away with all this stuff. Well, having an internal perspective, you'll think, hey, one day they'll get what's coming to them. Right? And it's the same with people that are dealt a not so good a hand. How many times do you, you know, hear people say, hey, you know, life's unfair. You know, for people that are you know, chronically ill, people that are disabled, people born in different situations. And they're right. You know, they're right. Life, if, if all there is is this life, you're right. Life is unfair. But that's not the truth. This life isn't all there is, right? We need to have an eternal, there's an eternity awaiting us after this life. And, you know, that will help you have the right perspective for, you know, God will balance the scales one day. So not only can it help you cope with your own suffering, help you, you know, sort of see, 
you know, and, and justify, you know, see the injustice in the world that is going on and feel a bit, at least a little bit better about it. Also the injustice in people's lives. But it, what I'm trying to do here today is, well, it can also change your priorities. It can also change your priorities in life. If all you think about is the tempor temporary, your priorities are going to be different to if you have an eternal perspective and you're looking to what will actually last you. And this is where 1 Corinthians 3 come into it. Because you know what? God isn't trying to give you your best life now. You know, some people buy into this whole prosperity gospel. And prosperity gospel, what they mean by that is not necessarily about being saved and going to heaven. What they mean by that is, you know, if you're a Christian and you're obeying God and you're in church, you're a saved person, hey, you're, you're meant to be healthy, wealthy and wise and God's going to give you everything you need and you're never going to suffer anymore and, you know, you have a great marriage and great kids and everything's going to be fine, die in an old age, perfect health. This is a lie. This doesn't happen. If you, just, you just have to look, you just have to read the book of Acts. We're going through the book of Acts with the children and kids club, you just have to read the book of Acts and you see, you know, the jail breaks, the suffering. I mean, Paul seeing here, our light affliction. I mean, did he have his best life now? They're all looking for their best life later. So there's no best life now. God is not trying to give you your best life now. And sometimes people get stumbled at Christianity. How many times have you spoken to somebody and, you know, they're a bit burnt with God or they're a bit, you know, upset at things? And, and why? Because they can't understand why God is allowing them to go through these things. They can't understand why a loving God is allowing all this suffering in the world. It's, it's something that people have, so many people have a wrong perspective of, and it can change what they think about God. So God isn't trying to give us our best life now. He allows suffering in this world. One is because it you know, makes us better. That's the main purpose. The main purpose is not only does it punish the wicked, it also punishes people that are doing wrong and chastises his children, but also, when we go through suffering, it, it improves us, builds character, builds some resilience. But you know one thing it also does is it makes you look at the unseen. Because when you start realizing all the problems with the scene, you don't desire the scene anymore. You start desiring the unseen. And that's one of the goals, I think, that God allows us. You know, suffering reminds us that this world is not perfect. This world is not our eternal home. So we don't start to desire to just be comfortable and live in something that is temporary. We start to think about, hey, what can we prepare for in, in, the, in eternity, in our eternal home? So it's got to change your priorities. It's going to change your perspective. And that's why I was saying, you know, when I was talking before, hey, I hope, you know, this lockdown is terrible for a lot of people. You know, people have lost jobs and people are going through all sorts of suffering right now. I'm sure people even now are saying, you know, how is God letting all this happen? When, you know, they should be blaming our politicians, right, for doing this sort of stuff. But you see, at the very, if at the very least, this suffering that people go through, you know, we hope that it reminds them, hey, this world is not all there is. You know, maybe they lost their business, maybe they've, you know, even lost some loved ones and they're struggling to think about how to reconcile all this suffering that's going on in the world. And, you know, to, to one of the factors could be it's a bit of a wake-up call. You know, it's a wake-up call for people to have the right priorities. Now, why is it important where your priorities are, whether it's in this life or in the next life? Because that's where your heart's going to be. Matthew 6 is a famous passage by Jesus. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be be also. So you see how you're where your perspective is, either in the temporary or the internal, that's where your heart's going to be. So it's very important that you have the right perspective. That's what I want to try to do today. I'm trying to refocus your attention where it should be, on the things that are unseen, on the eternal things. This is why in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes has these interesting passages which say, hey, it's actually better to be sad than it is to be happy. You know, I mean, this is what happens when people go to a funeral. Sometimes when you go to a funeral, you start to reflect on life. You start to reflect on, hey, what am I doing with my life? What am I doing with my time? One, time I, one day I'm going to be that person that is dead in that cas casket. And what did I do with my time? What did I do with my life? What are people going to remember me for? Ecclesiastes 7, look at these passages here. A good name is better than precious ointment. And the day of death and the day of one's birth it is better to go to the house of mourning 
and to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. So this, see, this is why sometimes you have to believe the Bible by, by faith, because this is so counterintuitive to what most people in the world would think. To say, hey, isn't it better to celebrate and to forget about our sorrows and to not think about death and that? And the Bible's actually saying, hey, it's better for you to actually go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. Why? For that, what? That the death is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. You'll see, you'll start to consider the fragility of life. You'll start to consider the temporary nature of life, and you'll start to think, what is life really about? Sorrow is better than laughter. For by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of of mirth. We're going to see that in this sermon, you know, the difference between being wise and being foolish. We're talking about being a wise master builder. Let's get into 1 Corinthians 3, focus on the passage of Scripture that we want to focus on in 1 Corinthians 3. It starts at verse 10, where it talks about us building on this foundation and the different things we can build on there. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. So he's saying, hey, take care. When you're saved, you get this foundation, Jesus Christ. And when it comes to the Corinthians, Paul is saying, hey, he's laid that foundation. Why? Because he preached the gospel to them. He, says, he said to them, you know, I've uh, determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. So when he went there, he went to preach them the gospel, he helped them lay that foundation. But now he's saying, hey, let every man take heed. Pay attention, right? How he buildeth thereupon. So this shows that there is a good way to build on that foundation and there's, and there's a bad way. There's a foolish way and there's a wise way. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. We're saying, hey, obviously that foundation which we lay on this spiritual house, right, is Jesus Christ is that foundation. Now if any man build upon this foundation... Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. So we're given a few examples of things you can use to build upon this foundation. You have gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Verse 13, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. Right. So verse 13 is saying, hey, your work is going to be made known, because the day shall declare it. It's going to be tried by fire because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. And I'll just pause there for a moment, because a lot of people will use 1 Corinthians 3, especially those from you know, a Catholic background. They'll go to 1 Corinthians 3 to try and teach that there is such a thing as purgatory. So purgatory, if you don't know what that is, purgatory is like this middle ground between heaven and hell, that if you're not bad enough to go to hell, you, but you're not good enough to go to heaven, then you go to purgatory where you'll like, be burned and you know, purged of your sins. And once you're purged of your sins, then you'll, you'll go to heaven. They use this passage trying to teach. So this is purgatory. It's teaching here that, you know, see, you're going to go through this fire and you know, you're going to be purged before you go to heaven. But notice what is being revealed by fire. What is actually being burned here? Is it the, is it the builder? that is getting burnt? No, no, it's actually the work that is getting burnt. So this is not describing purgatory. This is describing somebody's works in their life. You know, once, you know, if you have the foundation, and we'll talk about that in a moment, you need the foundation first. But what it's talking about is you're building on this foundation and then your work is going to be tried. It's going to be real. And the fire shall try every man's work, you see, of what sort it is. So it's not trying the person. It's not burning the man. It's burning his work. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So notice it's trying his work, right? So it's not burning off his sins. You say, well, in those works, like his sins. Well, no, because you can, nobody's trying to sin their way to heaven. You know what I mean? Like no, nobody thinks, I'm just gonna, I'm trying to get, work my way to heaven. I'm just going to sin as much as I can, and hopefully I get to heaven. Right? So this is like people trying to do good. But we have good things that are wise and good things that are foolish in terms of building on this spiritual 
foundation. Now notice here at the end, verse 15. If any man's work shall be burned. So let's say on this foundation. Remember, you have gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. So you see two categories of materials here. You see three where it can abide a fire. It can go through a furnace. But obviously wood, hay, and stubble can be burnt up. If any man's work shall be burned, look at this, he shall suffer loss. So you see how you will diminish in your rewards, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So you say, how many people believe, oh, if I don't have the works, I'm not going to get to heaven. I need to have good works to get me to heaven. Well, the Bible says here, even if your works are all wood, hay, and stubble, it all gets burnt up, and you'll suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet to us by fire. Why? Because the foundation you don't lay, that's Jesus Christ. Right? You just believe on Jesus Christ, you receive that foundation. And then you build upon this foundation. So I'm just going to talk about this passage, talk about three things in this passage and, and give you some thoughts and some scriptures around it. So my first point is, I'm talking about being a wise master builder. First of all, you need to have a wise foundation. A wise foundation. Right, so we talk, we'll go to Matthew 7, verse 21. The wise foundation. Because unfortunately, some people have a foolish foundation that they're building this house on. And if you know Matthew 7 very well, we see the wise builder and the foolish builder and what they did different. And in fact, there's actually a kid's song as well to teach them this concept. You know, the wise man built his house upon the rock. You know, sometimes we sing that in kids' club. But let's start from verse 21. We'll see what this is talking about. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. We'll talk about what that is in order to get to heaven. Because some people will say, hey, you need to make Jesus your Lord in order to get into heaven. But look at what Jesus says. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. So some people make Jesus their Lord, but they don't get into heaven. Why? Because they don't make Jesus their Savior. See, what's important is Jesus is your Savior, not only that he's your Lord. See, being, him being your Lord is what you do as a saved person. But in order to get saved, you need to make Jesus your Savior, which is trusting what he did for you on the cross, not trying to follow him to be saved. We follow him in response to being saved, not in order to get saved. So he says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. So notice here in verse 22, if you were to think of somebody following Jesus, doing the works of Jesus, living a spiritual Christian life with a lot of good works, I mean, would, is this not what you would picture? Would you not picture somebody saying, hey, pre prophesied in thy name, you're preaching in the name of Jesus Christ, casting out devils in the name of Jesus Christ, doing many, many wonderful works in the name of Jesus Christ? I mean, whether that's miraculous works or whether that's good works, you know, a lot of social work and all this sort of stuff. You would think, is this not the picture-perfect Christian? But yet, why can Jesus say in here in verse 23, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So when you read here, are they claiming to do iniquity? Are they saying, we didn't care? We don't care about you. We wanted to live our own life. Oh, you know, God, you know, whatever. They're not doing that, right? These are people that were honestly, well, tr well they were trying to serve the Lord. They were trying to serve what they believed to be God, Right? In thy name, then thy name cast that out. But what was the problem? Why can Jesus say, I'll pro then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Because what were they trusting to get them into heaven? Their wonderful works. See, so if Jesus said to me, hey, I never knew you, what would you say? But I believed on you. I believed on you. You died for me. Right? But this is not the first thing they say. The first thing they say when they come to him, hey, look at all the works that we've done. We've prophesied in your name, we've cast out devils in your name, and in your name done many wonderful works. And if somebody's trusting their works to get them to heaven, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, 
ye that work iniquity. So that's what the difference here. So the will of God here is that we believe on him. We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. We're not trusting our own works. And this is where when it comes to the foundation, you can have a wise foundation, you can have a foolish foundation, right? What's the difference? The wise foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what my salvation is pinned on. The foolish foundation is, hey, why, why do you think you're going to heaven? Well, that's because I'm a pretty good person. I'm not a rapist. I'm not a murderer. You know, I'm, I'm pretty good. Yeah, I sin a little bit, but you know, I go to church. You know, I, don't, you know, I try and do the best that I can. These are the sort of things people say to you when you ask them, why are they going to heaven? Yeah, it's because I'm a pretty good person. I don't sin that much. That is the foolish foundation. That's for somebody that is putting their faith on their works to get them hoping that they will be good enough to get them to heaven and not putting it on the foundation of Lord Jesus Christ. This is why we get to verse 24. And it says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And we know the Lord Jesus Christ is, is always talked about as our, the rock of our salvation. Right? We build our house on the rock. It's something that doesn't move. It's solid. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house. And it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. So it's interesting. I mean, what can these rains depict? You know, sometimes the rains, you think it's tribulation and persecution. Yeah, but maybe it can be the temptation and struggle in your life as well. You know, no matter what goes on in your life, hey, it comes, it comes, and it doesn't, it doesn't fall. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't go to hell because it's on the rock. It's founded upon a rock. So not only does it represent that, but it can represent, obviously, you know, when it comes to God's judgment as well. When God's judgment comes, the house doesn't fall. Why? Because it's founded, it's got the wise foundation, founded upon the rock. Verse 26, And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell and great was the fall of it. So you see here a house that is built on like the shifting opinions of man. One day I'm doing good, one day I'm doing bad, and sometimes I'm good, sometimes I'm bad. You know, this is the foolish foundation. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So notice here, when the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon the house that was on the sand, it says, and it fell, and look at this, and great was the fall of it. So we need to make sure we have a wise foundation. Right? So a wise builder has the right foundation. So you need to make sure, hey, why? You, know, you ask yourself, why am I going to heaven? Why am I saved? Is it because what Jesus Christ did for me? Well, if, Je if what Jesus Christ did, he died, was buried, he rose again, then how can I ever lose my salvation? How can I ever not be saved? I mean, it's based on him. He did it. He's done it all. It's not based on me. If I have a foolish foundation, then it's, oh, you know, I do some good in my life. I do some bad in my life. I did that sin, yeah, but it was because of this, and then I need to justify it. You need to try and... So if you're thinking that, then you have the foolish foundation. right? You want to make sure you have a wise foundation. Now, second of all, so we have a wise foundation, being a wise master builder. Second, we have, we have to have wise materials. Wise materials. If you remember in 1 Corinthians 3, we saw the gold, silver, precious stones, the things that can abide the fire, the sort of works that we do. And then we have the wood, hay, and stubble, the things that will not abide the fire. When we talked about in 2 Corinthians 4.18, you know, it's the things that are seen, which is the wood, hay, and stubble, but it's the things that are unseen, which is the gold, silver, and the precious stone. Let's look here in Luke 12 of a parable of somebody that built with foolish materials. Foolish materials. Luke 12, verse 13. This is the parable of the rich fool. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. So he's saying here, that's not what life, life is about. Life is not about how much you can amass, how much you can get. And it's not just about the material things. 
Verse 16, And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. So his barns are already full, and rather than thinking, hey, I've got sufficient here, and you know, maybe I can use it and use the same barns. No, he just wants to build more barns to hoard more for himself. Verse 19, And I will say to my soul, Soul, there was much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. So we see here the problem with the rich fool is not that he has riches, right? It's the purpose for which he wants these riches. So he wants to just build up more and more and more. Why? Because he wants to take it easy. He wants to just now relax and just you know, enjoy the fruit of his labor and just you know, eat, drink, and be merry. See, this is the problem. The question is, it's not, are, is it wrong to have goods? The question is, what is the purpose for which you want these goods? And if you're laying up all these things, you know, obviously this is building on things. This is the wood, hay, and stubble that is being built on. Uh, this foundation. So here he just wants to relax. So he's saying it to himself. So, you know, hey, I've worked hard. Now it's time for me to relax and just, you know, take it easy and enjoy. You know, this is somebody that has a temporary perspective and not an eternal perspective. Because you know what? If you have an eternal perspective, that last 10, 20 years of your life where most people go into retirement, you, I, if it was me, I'd be thinking, hey, I've got 20 more years to work to build upon this foundation. And then, yeah, I've got eternity to relax and take it easy. I should work hard now and build upon my foundation. But God said unto him, Thou fool, thou fool. So we're talking about foolish materials, wise materials. So notice, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself. So notice, right? So obviously part of our life is laying up treasure, but to, for what purpose? To use toward God, right? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So is he. So we see here the rich fool, what he did. He lived for himself. He just, all he was trying to do was amass wealth. And the Bible says here in verse 21, so is he, so are you. If you lay up treasure for yourself and you are not rich toward God. So we don't want to build on our foundation these, with these foolish materials, right? You don't want your life just to be about, you know, some people just dedicate their life to, you know, they just have this dream of owning this business one day and, that's, and then their life is just about that. And then to what end? Right? Once you die, who are you going to leave it to? So is it wrong to build a business and do that? But to what end? Right? If the business is an end in and of itself, you've got the wrong materials. Right? Or some people, you know, they just work, they work their, you know, their, their fingers to the bone and they just like you know, blood, sweat and tears just so they can buy this little property in Sydney you know, with the inflated prices. You're spending millions of dollars to buy this property. And then now they can call this little piece of land their home. And you know, one day you're going to be looking down from heaven and you're going to see it all go gone you know blood all that blood sweat and tears so what 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 are you going to spend your life doing right what are you going to aim towards now you know some people have the ability and the efficiency to be able to do that because i'm not saying it's wrong to own a house don't get me wrong right i'm talking about the purpose for which you live some people they make it their life goal it's all they're about it's all they think of it's all they live for and then when they think they've arrived they're like the rich fool ah oh, man just take it easy this is the problem now, what does the gold, silver, and precious stones represent in 1 Corinthians 3 as we build on this foundation? You know, sometimes I ask people when we go out soul winning, when somebody gets saved or we're talking to somebody that's saved, we're trying to encourage them to serve the Lord. We'll ask them the question, well, what are the only things you can take to heaven with you? You think about when you're in heaven, what are the things from this life, when you get to heaven, you're going to be able to take with you? So well, I can't take my boat, can't take my yacht, can't take my, you know, car, can't take my motorcycle, can't take my PlayStation. 
Can't take, you know, all these things. You, you know, ladies, can't take your shoe collection. Ah. Take your makeup, I don't know, your jewellery. You know, your fancy clothes, your LV handbag. Can't take those things to heaven. What can you take to heaven? Well, I say it was two things. One is, you can take yourself. All right, make sure you take yourself. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. What's the only other thing that you can take from this life into heaven with you? It's other people. It's the only other thing. Now, if you think about that, and you internalize, you know, you internalize that, think about having an eternal perspective. Man, when I, when I die, I leave this world, and I look on my foundation, what is going to be there? So what is this gold, silver, and precious stones? It's the work you do for God to get people to heaven. That's what's building. That's, what's, uh, that's part of your gold, silver, and precious stones. We all play a different part in how we win people to the Lord. But that's what it is. It's people. You know, what else could it be if it's not bringing more people to the new heaven and the new earth? So you think about how you're building on this foundation. The question is, what impact... Or what uh, contribution do I have to God's work that is adding people to the kingdom of God? And that's why this is what the church is about. This is what Christianity is about. It's the purpose of your life as a believer. It's the Great Commission. right? We preach the gospel, gospel. We baptize believers. And we're teaching people to do the same. right? Why do we want to live? Why do we want to do all these things? Because it's to bring more people to heaven. Right to build on that gold, silver, and precious stones. Look at First Peter two. Show you here this, uh, these uh, how we are likened to precious stones. First Peter two. To whom coming as unto a living stone. He's talking about Jesus, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. So you see how Jesus is referred to a precious stone. Well, why? Because in God's house, which is built up of stones, Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Right. But then we are stones that make up this house. Verse 5, ye also as lively stones, right? So this means that these stones are alive, right? And active. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up sacrifice, spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, this is Jesus, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made, the head of the corner. So these are the people that reject the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why in Psalms it says, you know, the chief corner, those that the builders disallowed, the same is made, the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient. Weren't you also? Um, they are, and I don't think I got the rest of that verse. So you can see how Jesus is likened to this rock. And you know, you can either build your house on this rock. If you don't, you know, you're going to get crushed by this rock. It's going to be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Weren't you also? They uh, were, and I don't have the rest of that passage there for some reason. First Thessalonians 2. Look at what it says here. So this is Paul now. When he talks about you know, his rewards in heaven, his crown of rejoicing. He says, For what is our hope or joy of crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For ye are our glory and joy. So we have the wise foundation. You either believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, not on your works to be saved. Right? And remember, you can't have a combination of the two. Right? So if it's by grace, then it's no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. If it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. So you have a choice of foundation. You believe on Jesus Christ, it's only Jesus Christ. And then you build upon that foundation. Or your foundation is a foundation of works, a foolish foundation. And then you have wise and foolish materials. What is your life about? What are you building upon this foundation? The temporary, the scene, the wood, hay and stubble? Or are you building gold, silver, Precious stones, and what is it? It's people, isn't it? That's the only thing you can bring with you to heaven. It's other people. That's why we've got to preach the gospel. That's why we've got to share the gospel with other people. Now, the third one I want to talk about is, so you have a wise, you're a wise master builder. Wise foundation, wise materials, and I've sort of touched on it already, but 
a wise purpose. A wise purpose. Because, you know, when everything is gone, what is going to be left? You know, when your works are all burnt up, what's going to be left? That ought to change how you live. That ought to change your priorities. You know, what you do in your life. When you make decisions about what you're going to spend your time doing, do you have some dedicated to winning the loss to Christ? If you don't, are you just building wood, hay and stubble on your foundation? You know, you need to have some time dedicated to winning people to the Lord. Second Peter 3, look at this. This is talking about the end times, right? End times, what's going to happen when Jesus comes, you know, and all the way at the end, you know, after the millennial reign, there's going to be a judgment. It says here, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, with, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Right? So that's repenting from dead works, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Not repenting from sin. Right? We repent from sin every day. Repentance from dead works. We're not trusting our works like we're switching foundations. Right? Switching from the foundation of our dead works, the sand, to the Lord Jesus Christ. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. You see, one day all this stuff is going to be gone, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things, what are all these things, all the things that are seen, all the things that are in the earth, all the things that we put our blood, sweat and tears into sometimes, we get caught up in the rat race, you know, the physical. That's why today at church I'm trying to point you back to the eternal. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. They're going to be gone one day. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? What is it saying there? What sort of person should you be knowing this? How should you live your life? What manner should your life be? How should you spend your time? How should, what should your purpose be in life? Knowing that one day all these seen things are going to be dissolved. You should be looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. You see there that eternal perspective, looking not at the seen, but at the unseen, the unseen now. One day it will be seen. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. So is it wrong to work? No. But why work and make money? So... You can have resources to have more time to win people to the Lord. Right? So it's all about having a wise purpose, a wise end. You know, it's not the means is not the end. It's a means to an end. Is it wrong to have fun? Is it wrong to relax, to recover? No, but, you know, why enjoy some things in life? Well, so you can be more productive. You know, for the Lord Jesus Christ, you can win more people to Christ. You know, corporations have figured this out. They can't just work people six days a week, 12, because they end up getting less from them. They realize, okay, you give them some leave, get them to rack, and they come back, they're refreshed, more productive. The happier, happy worker is a more productive worker. So is it wrong to enjoy something? Somewhere? No, it's all right to be happy in life. You know, the Christian life is in all sadness and burden and everything. We're expected to be joyful, right? That's one of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. Right? We want to be, have some joy in life, but, what, but what's the reason? So we can be more productive, Win people to the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, why get married? What's marriage for? So you can raise a godly family, have a godly marriage, so you can win more people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? So it all comes back to having this wise purpose. You know, why have a church? What is church about? We have a church, we have a godly community. Why? So people can be planted in here, so they can learn, they can encourage and exhort it to win more people <laughs> to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's exactly it. Now, why resist tyrannical governments? You know, always, we're on the lockdowns because the lockdowns are happening. And all this, all this stuff. What's the purpose of it? We resist tyrannical government so we can have freedom in our country 
to gather for church. People can be planted here to learn, to grow, to win people to the Lord Jesus Christ. You see how it all comes back to having that wise purpose, building the gold, silver and precious stones on this foundation. So do you have a wise purpose? Or are you like the rich fool? You know, just seeking ease and pleasure in life. I want to just finish on one last passage. I'm just going to go through this. Because I think Ecclesiastes 12 is just always a great reminder that one day life will be over. And this is why, when is the time to serve the Lord? The time is now. The time is now to serve the Lord. Ecclesiastes 12, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. You say, well, I'm I'm not young anymore. Well, then just just remember now. All right, you can just ignore that bit. (laughs) Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. While the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. And then we have this beautiful analogy here of, you know, somebody getting old, you know, When the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain, in the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble. So I'll just give you, I'll I'll just mention, if you haven't read this passage before and you don't know what all these represent, I'll give you my, my thoughts on what I think they represent and what most people think they represent. So in the day when the keepers, your hands, of the house shall tremble, because you think your hands, they take care of you, right? And the strong men shall bow themselves. So what I think that is talking about is, you know, your back. You know, when people start to get old, they start to, start to hunch over, right? Your core muscles. The strong men shall bow themselves. And the grinders, right, cease because they are few. You start to lose your teeth. And those that look out of the windows be darkened. You know, as you get older, your eyesight starts to fail. And the doors shall be shut in the streets, when the sound of the grinding is low. Now, what do I think that's talking about? Well, when you start getting older, you have less, stre- you have, you have less energy. You start going to sleep earlier. And he shall rise up at the voice of the bird, and all the daughters of music shall be brought low. So not only here it's saying, you know, you, you know the elderly tend to go to sleep earlier. They tend to wake up very early because they struggle to also sleep as well sometimes. And all the daughters of music shall be brought low. They start to have hearing problems. Also, when they shall be afraid of that which is high, you know, when you start to be old, you start to be more scared. Things seem to be higher than they used to. I remember even now, like when I was younger, I used to do what was called this Chinese lion dance, right? And you jump along the poles, you know, back before I was, you know, a dedicated Christian. And, uh, you know, now I think of the things I used to do when I was young. I'm just like, oh, that's insane. I can't believe I didn't break my legs and break my back and all sorts. One time we, we did a jump and I missed the pole, like my, because my. I don't know if you've seen those Chinese poles, and I'm sort of going on a tangent here, but the, the, the plates are about that big on these poles. And sometimes we had like one, 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 and then two. So the idea was I jump from this one, and then the guy behind me lifts me all the way, and I land on the two. And once, the, the guy that was behind, who was my partner, he went to step on that set, and he missed. He went down. So his chest went into that pole, oh, and I was just floating like, oh, and I just like landed on my back. Ooh, it's a close call. But now I think back to those days and I'm thinking, man, that was insane, like the things I was doing back then. Um, fears shall be in the way and the almond tree shall flourish. You think about the almond trees, like the white flowers, talking about the grey head. The grasshopper shall be a burden. Now what I think this grasshopper is talking about, I was reading a bit about getting, getting some opinions. They're saying, well, you, you don't have as much flexibility anymore. I'm sure, I'm sure Pat can, can, uh, can relate here. You know, like grasshopper, you think about grow lively or jumping around, and when you get, get all the things start to stiffen up. And that's what the grasshopper is being. It's to be a burden. You know, to move around, it's, start, it's difficult now. Desire shall fail, right? So not only, you know, sexual desire, hunger, a lot of things start to go away because man goeth to his long home. He's talking about eternity, his long home, and the mourners go about the streets. So this is now painting that picture of somebody going, dying. Verse 6, or ever the silver cord be loosed, a lot of people think that is the uh, spinal cord, or the golden bowl be broken, this is when your brain, you know, you think about the cranium holding your brain, 
or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern. If you're wondering what this is, I always thought maybe this was talking about going to the toilet. But some people uh, think that is referring to the heart, the heart having two chambers, right? So broken at the fountain, the wheel broken at the cistern. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, all is vanity. So this is the perspective that if there is not something after this life, if there is not eternal, what is life all about? One day it's going to be over. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. He gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads and as nails, fasted, fastened by the masters of assemblies. What is that talking about? The words, wise words, they prod you in the right direction. It's a goad, a sharp stick that they would poke into animals to get them moving. And nails fasten something down so it doesn't move. The words of the wise are as goads and as nails, fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd, right? They all come from the Lord Jesus Christ. And further by these, my son, be admonished of making many books. There is no end. Much study is a weariness of the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good and whether it be evil. So one day life is going to be over, hopefully later rather than sooner. And when you come to the end of your life, what was it about? Did you fear God and keep his commandments? What are you building on this foundation? One day, you know, when this life is over, there will be a judgment. And how are you building upon your foundation? Are you being a wise master builder? All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord. Uh, in your word, there's so many exhortations and reminders to be a wise master builder. Lord, help us, first of all, to have the right foundation. And I pray if anyone is not saved in here, that they will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They will not trust their works. They will turn from trusting their good works or their dead works and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. We have the right foundation. I pray as well, Lord, for all that are saved here, that they will be wise master builders. They will build with wise materials. Lord, help us to make sure we keep our eyes on eternity and we make sure that we are doing something to put gold, silver and precious stones on our foundation. Lord, help us to have the right purpose in our life. I pray, Lord, that everything we do in our life has a goal of putting more gold and silver and precious stones on our foundation. So, Lord, help us. We're not perfect. We need to be reminded. We need to be encouraged. And um, I just thank you, Lord, for the, uh, the reminder this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.